Hello everyone. Before we get into today's episode, we'd like to take the time to thank our executive producers, Jeremy Marcoux and Eustace Abel, as well as all of our patrons. If you'd like to donate to the show, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash histories most, where you can donate either a dollar a month, or if you'd like to become an executive producer, you can donate five dollars as well. Thanks so much for all your support, and on with the episode. Imagine a democracy where instability is normalized. A newly found democracy where, in only four years of existence, over 350 government members and politicians had been assassinated. Add to that economic instability. A country where, in less than a year, the price of a loaf of bread can go from 160 marks to 200 billion marks. A place where one needs to get their shopping done in mere minutes, because in the time between entering and exiting the store, the price of your items could increase. Last episode, we promised it would have to get worse before it gets better. And it certainly has gotten worse for history's most precarious democracy. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of History's Most. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and this is the second in our series on the, well, the rather unstable, depressing story of the Weimar Republic, Germany's first true democracy in the interwar period. Yeah, indeed. Uh, We left off last time with an attempted coup um, and the rise of kind of the right wing in some ways. Uh, We've been seeing a lot of political violence flaring up coming from both sides, but... It's... um... The story of the first couple of years of the Republic is, is is what we covered last time, so we'd encourage you to go back and listen to our, our previous episode if you haven't done so already. And it was the story of, of instability. It was a difficult birth for the German Republic when you had extremists on right and left rising up to try and overthrow this, this kind of liberal democracy. And, well, um, that isn't going to change anytime soon mm. um, in, in the next few years that we're going to cover today. Indeed. Um, I think, uh, what, was the, what was our last uh, episode called? History's most um, precarious democracy? or Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, th- I think it, that carries over from just the early years of the Weimar Republic. It continues to be pretty unstable, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think uh, particularly the period we're going to cover today from around 1920 to 23, um, it's hardly a, um, you know, a stable and peaceful time in Germany, let's say. There is plenty of, um, plenty of trouble still in store. Right, well, let's get into it. So we, we ended last time talking about the Cat Putsch, which was a sign of the growing displeasure from the right with the current government, the SDP. So, I assume it only escalates from there, right? Yes and no, I suppose. I mean, the the cat putsch from these these Freikorps, you know, far-right militia units um, w- was in part triggered by the fact these units were about to be demobilized, um, mm. thanks in no small part to the Treaty of Versailles that the the government had reluctantly signed up to. And that did mean that, you know, these these armed militias that were roaming the country in 1919 and 1920 were, to a large extent, demobilized. However, in reality, what you had was that the, the hardcore of these groups basically went to ground and became underground, if you like. Mm and formed, you know, secret societies or patriotic leagues that were 
kind of masking paramilitary activity. Right. So they can't do this uh, openly. Exactly. And you have, have reports of people um, we'll come to talk about, particularly Bavaria, um, the South German state, of residents of Bavaria talking about how they can hear in the night training exercises going on. And it's not, you know, the army training. Mm. It's these secret armies that still are in existence, um, kind of at the fringes on the political extremes. And actually, that's exactly what happens to a lot of the cap putschists. Um, very, very few people are called to account for this that far right um, takeover attempt we learned yesterday uh, last episode, um, and instead they they basically go to ground. A few of them go into exile, and a few of them um, go to Bavaria. Hmm. Bavaria, as as we talked about, because Ludendorff is one of the people who runs to Bavaria, um, and we talked in General Ludendorff's biography that we did in History's Most Guilty Man, Episode One. Um, Bavaria is a very conservative state, um, strongly Catholic, and considers itself quite separate from the rest of Germany, not least um, due to religion, but also a kind of state's rights sort of um, Mm. tradition of of exerting their independence from Berlin. So it's the ideal home for a load of political, um, almost, you know, political refugees who are fleeing um, from basically repercussions of being involved in the Cap Putsch. And one of those figures is a guy called Captain Hermann Erhardt. Um, he was actually a Navy captain and he had been a important Fry Corps leader. He'd led, he'd been the commander of um, the Marine Brigade Erhardt that had really been the spearhead of the Cap Putsch. And he was one of these figures who fled to Bavaria along with quite a lot of his followers from his Fry Corps, mm. um, his Marine Brigade, as it was called. And they, for the time being, were trying to lie low in Bavaria. They were they were put up by um, kind of wealthy landowners who were sympathetic politically to them, and slightly comically, the, these these um, these far right would be revolutionaries were sheltered on these rural estates, disguised as as labourers working the land. Um, but, you know, these, these estate owners, I guess, had the excuse of, oh, well, yes, that's why we've got 20 men in <laughs> living on our land. They're, they're working the, the farms. Um, but they, they basically laid low. And they were helped in this by um, a guy called Ernst Perner, who was the Munich chief of police. And he actively helped these people to either escape the country or basically chain, getting false papers, things like that, so they could they could settle in Bavaria. Wow. Uh, you also had the, the government of Bavaria from 1920 to 21 was headed up by um, Gustav von Kahr, you know, one of these other uh, similarly uh, kind of reactionary conservative who deliberately created this policy of turning Bavaria into what he called a cell of order. It was going to be the antithesis of Berlin. You know, if Berlin is mm. red, Bavaria is going to be, um, you know, counter-revolutionary. If Berlin is kind of um, modern and um, kind of progressive-looking, Bavaria is going to be conservative and traditionalist. So he was really trying to take Bavaria in a different direction. He helped this this kind of um, establishment of of armed groups by creating a a what you might call a home guard, which numbered actually eventually several hundred thousand men that was supposed to defend against communist uprisings. Um, and of course they get arms and training from the army and the army within Bavaria was pretty sympathetic to, to this cause. So mm. you get um, really a, a playground for far right extremists. Um, even you might say a greenhouse for, for far right radical right movements yeah in um, Bavaria and in particular in its capital city, Munich, at that time. So they're essentially being encouraged by the government. It, exactly. it, that's, uh, 
and, and and the government of Bavaria wasn't afraid to stand up to the the Berlin regime. Mm. Um, you know, they refused to put in place certain republican laws in Bavaria. They um, the the civil the guard or home guard that I mentioned was kind of a defiance of Versailles that they got away with for a little while. Um, so this was an ideal hunting ground if you are an extreme rightist because you have a, a regime that's sympathetic to you and also is not going to necessarily hand you over to the authorities further north. Mm. This this going back to Captain Earhart, who was a pretty unsavory character, um, he kind of takes this idea and really runs with it. Um, because after the political temperatures kind of cooled down a bit from the cat putch in the spring of 1920, once he's lain low for a while, by 1921, he feels emboldened enough to basically restart operations, if you like. Mm. And he forms a shadowy organization um, called Organization Consul. He is the, he's codenamed Consul as the leader of it. Right. And it's kind of a secret society, an underground militia, which is, is not kind of a mass organization, um, like a kind of secret society. It's, it's kept to a, very, a relatively small core of trusted um, kind of uh, members, mm. a lot of whom are drawn from his own Fry Corps unit that fled with him to Bavaria. And they eventually notch up about 5,000 members spread across the country. And they can train in Bavaria with the help of the police and the army. They get kind of w weapons smuggled to them. And the purpose of Organization Consul is, is this. They realize the cat putsch failed. Um, so for the time being, it seems like a, a far-right coup attempt is not going to succeed. But they want to keep up the pressure on the republic. So they devise a system uh, or a strategy essentially of really of terrorism, of mm. they're going to murder um, political opponents. They are going to carry out a campaign in 1921 and 1922 of, of political murders. Um, and the reason they do this is, is, well, partly quite simple in the sense it is pure revenge going back to the stab in the back myth we talked about yeah. last episode, of they see these people as traitors to the country who who they, they kind of earnestly believe they are serving up justice um, to. But also, I guess, on a higher level, they are thinking they, they want to destabilize the republic. They want chaos. Yeah. They want a collapse because, because, you know, they want either the left to rise up so the right can seize power and crush them or or they want to inspire people, you know, through their, their deeds um, to, to become opponents of the Republic and eventually overthrow it. Right. So what was happening in Berlin at this time? Uh, you know, what was the government's view of, of all this? Well... It because organization console was very much, you know, on the down low, it was keeping itself secret. Mm. Um, I think after the cat putsch, there was a, there was a kind of maybe even a slight sense of, um, of resting on the laurels that, that, that the right had been defeated. Mm. And it, it demonstrated that the far right couldn't seize power because, you know, they had come mighty close, but um, they'd failed. And things, I think the Republic and government, really started to take notice um, after the first um, organization, Consul Murder. Their campaign of murder was bookended, if you like, at the start and the finish with two really prominent um, victims. Mm. And the first victim was in August 1921 and was a politician who was especially loathed by the far right. It was a guy called Matthias Erzberger. Now, Erzberger was not actually a left-winger. He was a Catholic of the, the Centre Party, it was called the Catholic Party mm. of the period. And the reason that he was such, you know, a, he had such a target on his back, so to speak, was that he was um, responsible for signing the armistice in November 1918. Right. 
he had been a pretty prominent voice in favor of signing the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Um, he had even back in 1917 been um, a kind of leading advocate of um, peace in the First World War, basically. Let's, let's bring this conflict to a close. Let's all kind of come to a civil understanding. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine with the stab in the back myth that... This is, this is one of the, uh, what do they call them, November criminals. Absolutely. He was November criminal number one. Mm. And he'd been already quite for some time a target of the far right. He had, um, he, he had been involved in 1920 in a prominent libel case because of the, you know, the accusations made against him. And on his way to the courtroom, he had actually been shot. Um, a right-wing extremist had jumped on the mm. um, side of his car you know, back when cars, cars had, you know, the running boards at the side. Yeah. Those kind of 1920s cars. Uh, someone had jumped on the side of his car and shot him twice. Um, he had um, survived that, obviously. And he had also won the libel trial, although right. the kind of scandal around it had pretty much ended his political career because he had been finance minister at that time. Um, but... One of the things I mentioned last time was how the Weimar Constitution was really um, flawed in the sense that it didn't over, over overhaul the civil service, the judiciary, you know, the big institutions mm-hmm. of the state. And it had left in place the officials and systems from the Kaiser's time. Yeah. Well, th- this libel case was a classic example because the man uh, found guilty, a, a, a right-wing nationalist politician, of libeling Erzberger, despite being found guilty, the judge's sentence was um, a fine of 300 marks, which was about 50 pounds. Right. You know, so I don't know, maybe that's about $80, something like that. Um, which even in those days, money, you know, it was a pretty pitiful mm. um, fine for, for ruining someone's reputation. Um, I think... Um... Corrupt judges is going to be a running theme in uh, in some regards in this series. I think, yeah, um, neutrality is something that judges are supposed to aspire y- to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, one thing you've got to recall is the fact that these judges, you know, to be in the legal profession long enough to become a judge, you tend to be, you know, middle-aged or older, don't you? Um, yeah. So their careers, their legal careers, have been all the way through the Kaiser's empire um, in order to reach the position where they're judges in the 1920s. Mm. And during the Kaiser's time, um, both the Catholic Church and the Social Democrats were viewed as kind of subversive elements. Um, yeah. There have been times where, for example, the Social Democratic Party had been illegal. So these judges were used to you know, prosecuting left-wingers and things like this. Um, so I suppose you know, I'm not trying to defend them. I'm just saying, trying to explain why yeah, yeah. they had these biases. Um, is that the legal system they'd grown up in very much viewed um, the people who are now in power as a kind of subversive element? Mm, so that that makes sense. So organization consul was going to go after Erzberg, and they were going to get him this time. Mm. Um, he was actually in August of 1921. He was on holiday. Um, with his wife in the Black Forest in southern Germany. Um, and he he left the hotel for a morning walk um, with a fellow politician from also from the Centre Party. Um, so they're just out walking in um, in the countryside. And, you know, they, they were kind of chatting along with each other. And they didn't men- notice that, you know, there was a, a pair of hikers, or so they appeared, um, you know, passing them on this on this on this um, track through the hills, mm. and basically, when when they, these two men stopped Erzberger and his friend stopped for a rest, um, you know, it was a, it was a misty day, and these 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 two hikers again emerged from the mist, um, and one of them called one of them talk, approached him and said, "Are you Erzberger?" Mm. Um, and he said yes. And they both pulled guns and, and shot him. Jeez. Um, 
these two politicians only had umbrellas and they, they tried to defend themselves. They tried to hit back at these guys. But of course, um, yeah, you know, yeah. they, they, no, no chance. And he was shot at Sperger five times. Um, even then, even after being shot five times and these two guys having emptied their clips, as they were reloading, Erzberger tried to get away and, and um, trying to kind of take cover behind a tree. Um, so they, they obviously followed after him and, and shot him multiple times again mm. into that. Um, and pushed him down an embankment. Um, the, his friend survived, which is how we know what happened. But, yeah. You know, pretty grim stuff. I think you'll agree. Absolutely. Now, the two gunmen um, got away. They got back to Munich, um, where Organization Consul, by the way, I'm not sure if I've mentioned, um, operated under the name the Bavarian Wood Products Company. <laughs> nice. Nice cover. Mm. And the chief of police, Ernst Perner, um, what he did was he got them fake passports for them to to flee to Hungary. Um, they were, they then, you know, returned um, in order to continue their activities. Mm. And one of them, um, a guy called Heinrich Tillerson, uh, actually was arrested at one point. Um for not for that murder, but for involvement in in another plot. Mm. But his release was secured by a guy called Heinrich Brüning, who ironically was a centre party politician himself. But he, he described Tillerson as a decent sort of chap, um, and he got him out. Wow! And uh, Tillerson actually um, eventually was brought to trial for the crime of assassinating Erzberger in 1946. Um, obviously after the war. Mm. Um, but even then, uh, even after, you know, the fall of Hitler, etc., he was acquitted. And the court found that, um, and, you know, this is a direct quotation, the court found the assassination had been motivated by his exalted patriotic desire to lead Germany to a better future. Uh, okay. So political violence is justified as, as long as you think it's the best thing for the country. I know. And I mean, you can go back all the steps of that story to just Ernst Perner, the um, you know Munich chief of police. There is a pair of assassins in your city. And instead of arresting them, you ensure they can flee abroad. Yeah. You know, they're providing protection. It's just... It, it, it's jaw dropping when you think about it that you know he you know these are police officials who are under oath to uphold the law um but but you know their political preferences take uh, precedence Perna once said that well he he didn't say um he he had someone approach him um and and who was alarmed by the the number of right wing extreme groups operating freely in Bavaria. And they said, they reportedly said to him, um, you know, did, did you know political murder gangs are operating in Bavaria? And he replied, I know, but there's, um, you know, not enough of them. <laughs> wow. So that pretty much sums up his character, I think. Was there anything that Berlin could have done to kind of rope in the this corrupt system that's happening in Munich. Well, there was a few things that would come along. I mean, you could have said right back in the revolution, um, perhaps the whole system should have been overturned. Yeah. Um, they did take more decisive measures um, or attempted to um, a bit later on after... Um, the murder of, of Walter Rattenau. And like I said, the OC's campaign was bookended by two very prominent murders. So Erzberger was the first, Rattenau would be the last. In the between time, 
Um, and this was all, you know, in, in little more than uh, a year, I think it was, you know, really all mostly in 1921, 1922. They carried out more than 350 um, murders um, of politicians, yes, um, who they didn't like, but also informants, you know, people who, who told on them. Mm. Also, um, people who were reporting illegal act- armed activities or illegal uh, arms dumps to the authorities, you know, because Versailles was, was being enforced. Yeah. So they weren't all kind of these celebrity murders, um, but, you know, the sheer volume is, is eye-watering. They, they had tried and failed, by the way, to assassinate um, Philip Scheidemann, the chancellor, um, mm. in the in the start at the start of the republic, who we mentioned had declared the republic in 1918 um, from the, from the balcony of the Reichstag. Um, it, it, in that in that example, um, Scheidemann was um, walking in a park, um, and um, you know a, a, a member of OC. Um, tried to spray acid into his eyes. Oh, my God. Um, But um, Scheidemann, in this atmosphere, was clever enough to carry a a gun, Mm. um, which was probably wise, because when this happened, he he pulled his gun and and fired. He didn't didn't hit or or, or kill the assassin, the would-be assassin, but um, obviously he he turned tails and ran. Um, However, as I mentioned, the, the the most arguably the most famous and certainly the kind of the bookender of of the this campaign of murder was Walter Rattenau. Um now Rattenau was well, there was a number of, of things that made him an eligible candidate um for these right wing extremists. He was the foreign minister of the Weimar Republic. Mm. In that role, he had obviously, you know, he, he was involved in negotiating with the Allies about Versailles, involved in, you know, helping to fulfill the terms of Versailles once they were imposed. Um, he had um, also, in the early 20s, signed a treaty with the Soviet Union. Um, there was for a lot of the 1920s, a, a long-running friendship between the Weimar Republic and the Soviet Union, not because really of any ideological sympathies, but because uh, they were both really the two pariah states in Europe. Yeah. Um, so they could sort of club together and help each other out with trade and also secret kind of um, military exercise and things like that. Um, and the great irony is, is that... Um, Walter Rattenau was actually, you know, fairly right wing. He was very patriotic. He had um, really done an awful lot for the German war effort um, in the war. He was, you know, an industrialist and he'd, he'd really put his um, kind of uh, resources and his, his, his own personal efforts as well at, at the service of the state during the war. He had, donate, he had financed some of the Freikorps himself. Um, mm. and the, as well as his political crimes, I suppose, the other thing about Walter Rattenau was that he was a Jew. Right. And, you know, this was not unimportant for these far right extremists, um, because he was, you know, the, the exact, um, embodiment of that kind of conspiratorial version of the wealthy elite, you know, capitalist Jew who is, you know, also pulling strings in the political sphere. Mm. Um, and so, you know, he became a target for, for these people. And like Erzberger, he had been really kind of, you know, ridiculed and pilloried by the, by the right-wing press, called like a traitor, this sort of thing. And again, it's hardly surprising that this then leads to people wanting to act on those um, accusations. Um, 
And his murder, like the murder of Erzberger, was pretty brutal. Mm. Um, like, you know, with Erzberger's murder, it was clearly planned. You know, it was well planned. They had scouted it out. Um, and, and they'd kind of done their homework, so to speak, on how to how to kill him. In fact, I believe they had done kind of um, tests uh, about, you know, what what weapons they should use mm. um, because this was going to be quite a quite a complex plan, um, but this is exactly what OC existed for. Um, you know, these were not just a crazy guy with a gun. Yeah, these were a dedicated secret organization that was carrying out plots with the assistance of you know sympathetic figures in the army and the the police. So. Um, what they did was they um, they knew that he um, would drive. He was driven around in an in an open air car mm. um, in the back seat. You know, he's chauffeur driven. Um, so when that they basically followed his car leaving his house in the morning, and when it came to um, a bend and slowed down. The conspirators who were following behind uh, in a car um, basically pulled up alongside him and opened fire with um, a submachine gun, I believe, um, for, you know, from, from pretty much point blank range. Um, and obviously, you know, mm. killed him. Um, this was a really kind of um, massive you know, scandal both in um, Germany, but also internationally, because he was the foreign minister. He was quite a well-known, prominent political figure. Yeah. And there was real kind of mass anger and outrage. The, the next day, there was 700,000 people came to a memorial service um, that was kind of open air held outside the Reichstag. Um and a bit like how the Cat Putsch really energized support for the Republic and people coming out on strike and that, um, Ratnow's death, again, I think was a real moment, a real watershed moment of people thinking, you know, enough is enough. Um, there, um, you know, there's one Berlin newspaper said, you, it has struck Germany as a whole. You've slain one man but wounded 60 million. Um mm. And it is really, um, you know, at this point you were saying, you know, what could Berlin do about it? Well, they were determined to to basically put a stop to things here and make them pay for what they'd done. So the assassins um, were were really, there was a massive manhunt going on. Um, and they were basically sticking to these rural areas, these the, these assassins, a team of them trying to evade capture. Um, one of them went to a castle owned by his uncle um, and he was turned over to the authorities um, by his own uncle. Um, <laughs> the The gunmen themselves had a price on their heads, a million marks. Um, and so, you know, they were, they, they, there was the public out to get them. So they, um, tried to make it um, across the Baltic Sea to Sweden. Mm. Um, but they happened to, they, there was a boat arranged, I believe, for them, but they managed to miss it. Um, so instead, as you would, they decided to bicycle around the rural, um, rural northern Germany um, to kind of keep in, um, to keep themselves kind of, I guess, away from yeah. the authorities. Um, it was a, it's a really kind of um, one of those mad stories um, that, that they were like living rough basically in the forests. Apparently, they were hunting animals um, to survive. Occasionally, kind of going to the houses of of kind of farmers and things and begging for food. Um, you know, eating berries that they could pick off plants. Um, just one of these kind of outrageous kind of outlaw stories. Um, eventually, of course, um, 
they were they were caught. They stayed they they stayed at a castle of a, a right wing um, sympathizer, um, but eventually um, the the villagers um, who lived near the castle alerted the authorities. Um, but then <laughs> they developed like a siege situation, like a police standoff. Yeah. Um, so um, these two gunmen. Um, appeared like on the on the this castle walls um and they they told you know we will live and die for our ideals they were kind of defiantly shouting at the police the police marksman tried to um shoot them um mm. and one of them one of them was killed um the other one um fought, killed himself um right. so it really was a kind of um, dramatic kind of one of those, you know, you could almost like a film plot out of it, couldn't you? Um, mm. Stories of kind of outlaws um, eventually getting their comeuppance. Um, again, going back to what happens to these guys later in the Third Reich, you know, in, in Nazi Germany, they would be known as, as martyrs and have a, a memorial dedicated to them. Wow. But this obviously was not um, acceptable, and the Republic, as a result, um, passed a law. It was called the Law for the Protection of the Republic, which was a, an attempt to basically clamp down on these extreme groups. And organization, organization council was essentially um, this. This killing was essentially so prominent that they did for themselves. Um, and they really had to disband the organization because the authorities were, um, you know, determined not to let this lie, so yeah. to speak. So how was this law enforced? So, so they were based out of Munich, um, where the police is quite sympathetic to their causes. You know, what, what was going on there? Well, they still weren't, you know, like Erhard himself wasn't arrested. Um, they, they, you know, they weren't under um, under direct investigation. I would say, um, but the what happened was they realised that organisation console was basically um, under threat, and so they um, disbanded it. and And Erhard later would set up. Um, the what was called the Viking League, um, mm. another kind of paramilitary organization, but but really, I think this was the kind of the eclipse of of this policy of assassination, because when the Munich authorities tried to avoid um, implementing the the law for the protection of the public, it really only um, succeeded in in bringing about a, a much bigger conflict between Berlin and Munich that they really, in the long run, couldn't sustain. Um, and this law for the protection of the public, I mean, primarily it was about outlawing, you know, those groups that were engaged in political violence. Mm. Um, and it would be used to ban, you know, groups at different times. For instance, the, the Nazis uh, would be banned for a time under the law for the protection of the Republic. So, for a while, to some extent, it kind of kept a lid on things, I would say. Right. So, the, the these assassinations kind of come to an end, but I'm assuming that, you know, this political incivility, this, this isn't the end of it. You know, this is something that's going to continue to fester and grow in the, the political system, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all the reasons we talked about last time for political instability are pretty much still in place. Mm. Um, after the Cat Putsch, you had um, an election, um, and that election was pretty um, unfortunate for the Republic because the so-called Weimar Coalition, the three parties who were kind of most... Um, committed to this project of liberal democracy, namely the 
Social Democrats, the Catholic Centre, and the Democrats. They had won a majority in 1919 um, in the kind of first elections of the Republic that we mentioned. The elections held after the Cat Putsch, however, um, saw a big spike in support for parties that were basically opposed to the Republic, and those parties lost their majority. Um, this meant there was a change of government, and this time um, the Social Democrats were, were, other than a brief stint in 1921 and another brief stint in 1923, they were basically out of government. So you had a series of basically um, moderate to kind of centre-right governments take office in the early and mid-20s um, that were usually lacking a majority in the Reichstag, um, which which just made governance, you know, even harder. Yeah. You had um, a government led by Konstantin Fehrenbach that took office after that election in 1920, made up of the Democrats, um, the Centre Party, and the DVP, the German People's Party, which was a kind of, I think I described it last time, as like a neoliberal party. Um, but that cabinet resigned the following year when the final total of reparations was presented to them um, by the Allies, um, which they considered unacceptable. Um, another government came in, it lasted a few months, and then they resigned about territory being taken off them um, by the Allies, parts of Cilicia being given to Poland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so you actually had... Um, no less than, I think, nine um, changes of government in the period 1919 to 23. Wow. Um, which is really ludicrous, um, given it's a, it's a you know, four-year period. And yes, there was genuine crises and emergencies like the Treaty of Versailles, like the Cat Putsch. Um, but in all that time, and there's nine changes of government. Um, there was only um, two elections, so <laughs> it shows you how unstable and troublesome this system of proportional representation and coalition governments was. You know, coalition governments aren't necessarily a bad thing, but if it's the point where they can't agree on anything, to the, you know, to mm -hmm. this extent then yeah, it definitely does become a bad thing. Because as I've said, I think last episode, you've got to remember, this is Germany's first flavor of having a parliamentary democracy. Yeah. Um, if this is their first impression, and everyone always, you know, goes on about first impressions count, you know, this sort of thing. If this is the first impression, it's really, really negative because this system just isn't functioning. Yeah, I mean... I still can't get over what we said in the first episode um, that it was just, there's just divide di division um, between like every single uh, one of these small little parties mm -hmm. that wants to represent a very specific group yeah, and, of the population. That, I think that's a big reason why there was such cabinet instability is because these parties were each beholden to a particular interest group, which meant that, you know, if the government was doing something which their very narrow base of supporters wouldn't like, then they are pretty much in a corner. Mm -hmm. They can't um, go along with it because that is literally the party exists to represent X interest um, or X, you know, religious or, or, or class group. Then you can't do anything. You can't compromise on things that affect those people, mm. um, you know. So therefore, parties, you know, ministers in cabinets were very much beholden to their party machine of, ah, uh, well, we know that, um, you know, our voters wouldn't like this, so no, we're going to have to resign. Yeah. And that's why you got so many cabinets falling, often over, like, trivial issues, um, you know, Weimar cabinets fell from everything from, um, you know, what flag to use on certain occasions to um, 
I think things to do with like uh, Catholic education. Um, so, you know, in, in I think normal times in normal democracies, these issues wouldn't bring down a government. Mm -hmm. It's just that Weimar Germany was so unstable just from the very beginning. Absolutely, and and the fact you have this polarized, you know, superheated political atmosphere mm. as well. Well, yeah, that it doesn't lend itself to collaboration and, and compromise very much, does it? Yeah. So this instability, the, these, what do you say, nine changes of government in, in four years, um, surely can't be good for the economy. Well, <laughs> Weimar, as um, I think we emphasized last time, did inherit a pretty poor hand, so to speak. It was mm. dealt a poor hand. Um, and it was dealt a very poor hand, economically speaking. The reason for that was um, that the wartime German government had based all of their kind of wartime spending and budgets on the assumption that they were going to win the war mm. um, and that the massive costs of fighting the war were going to be paid by the defeated countries, that they would impose reparations on the countries they defeated and that those cash payments would cover the cost of the war. And for that reason, um, you know, for example, Britain during World War I massively increased the tax burden mm. to help pay for it. Germany hardly did at all. Despite fighting a world war for four years, they hardly touched taxes. Yeah. They just borrowed. They just worked. They just worked under the assumption that everything would yeah. be fine because they'd win. They wrote a giant IOU both to their own people with what were called war bonds and mm. obviously to the financial markets. And believed that they were going to win, so we don't need to worry about this debt piling up um, and, and uh, doing things like printing money as well, because we will win and we will then come into a whole load of money, which we can use to pay all this off. Now that meant that um, already um, during the war years, there had been inflation and the value of the German mark had certainly decreased. Mm -hmm. Um. So when Weimar, the Weimar Republic came into being, they inherited a, war, uh, a national debt of 1.44 billion marks. Right. Which back then, you know, was, was an extremely large figure. Um, you know, these days, I guess that figure of government debt would not be seen as large at all. But, you know, we're talking about 100 years ago here. Yeah. When, you know, governments rarely talked in billions back then. Um, so... When you're faced with, um, you know, very large national debt that you think might be unsustainable, obviously you've got to either, um, you know, cut your spending or you've got to increase taxes. Yeah. But again, the politicians of Weimar were in a very unenviable position because, um, you know, this new republic's been created. We know it faced very serious threats from right and left. We know the unpopularity because of Versailles, because of the stab in the back, this sort of thing. The last thing any Weimar politician wanted to do was raise taxes. Yeah. That's... Because that's going to be universally <laughs> incredibly unpopular. The other really dangerous political element as well was that no Weimar politician wanted to suggest raising taxes because they knew straight away the accusation would be, oh, you're raising taxes to pay for reparations. Mm. Our money, you are fleecing us of more money that's going to go straight to our enemies, yeah. you know, the allied powers. So there was this double kind of, um, uh, this double disincentive against raising taxes. Um, in terms of cutting spending, same thing applies. Um, cutting government spending is often very painful. The government just didn't want to do it at this very delicate time. They definitely didn't want to start cutting, say, the salaries of civil servants um, or police or the military when 
you know, these groups are exactly the people they need to stay loyal mm. against very serious political threats. So um, they even, you know, a big part of the Republic that was built by the Social Democrats was they wanted to expand the welfare system, produce a, like a comprehensive, um, you know, welfare safety net mm. for, you know, unemployment, health, this sort of thing. So that was a massive burden on state finances as well. Um, so all of this, obviously, um, is going to mean the debt situation. And with it, the um, the strength of the currency is going to be under serious pressure. Yeah. And it does enter a state of hyperinflation. It does. But... but... <sighs> You know, at this point, you might be saying, oh, it sounds so stupid. You know, what are they thinking? Mm. Um, On the other hand, um, to begin with, actually, this seemed to work quite well. Um, By 1921, unemployment uh, was basically zero, Um, which considering they'd just come out of a a world war and demobilization of millions of soldiers, it was a massive achievement. Mm. Um, you know, you look at um, Great Britain at the same time, the early 20s were a really difficult time for unemployment because of demobilized soldiers flooding the labor market, if you like. And German industry was doing really well out of inflation. Um, so, yes, prices were rising and they're rising at what we would consider um, a very worrying rate. Um I think prices um, uh, quadrupled between 1919 and 1920. Mm. But the government let this happen quite deliberately, and and industry was very much supportive of this because there there appeared to be an economic boom going on. So they didn't want to rock the boat. And that new um, kind of centre-right government of um, Ferenbach that I mentioned before... um, was very much um, influenced by, you know, kind of industrialist opinion. Mm. And you know what? Big business was totally in favor of this economic policy. Um, And and the reason um, that inflation was good for business was was really straightforward. You could take out a loan to grow your business, Mm. to invest, whatever, to open a new plant, whatever it might be, and a year later, you could repay it, and it would be, you know, next to nothing. Yeah. Because, you know, if you took out a loan in 1919 for 100,000 marks, to use a really straightforward example, I suppose, um, 100,000 marks, let's keep it nice around figures, and you make um, 10,000 marks profit a month, uh, instead of that loan taking you, you know, 10 months profit to, to pay back, Next year, when prices have quadrupled, it'll take you, what, you know, two and a half months yeah. profit to pay off that loan. So business was really profiting from this because they could, you know, um, it was kind of almost like free money. Um, so it's gaming the system. Yeah, you, you could, this, this, this credit was easy to repay, so it allowed the economy to expand really rapidly. Um, like I said... Uh, unemployment in Germany was next to nothing. I think um, it was 1.8%. And um, in the UK at the same time, it was 17%. Mm. So this appeared to be to be working. Obviously, then you've got to throw in reparations payments mm. to the Allies. And they weren't finalized until uh, 1921. The final figure, I think we might have mentioned it last time, 6.6 billion pounds. Um, they gave a figure in marks, but it was tied to gold. It was 132 billion gold marks. Um, that, as I mentioned before, Ferenbach's government resigned over over this figure that was presented. But mm. um, just as before, you know, the Germans had no choice but to accept. However, um, unsurprisingly, it was very difficult to keep up with these reparations payments. I think there's a slight misconception that um, you know, the government was printing money, allowing inflation to happen so that the reparations bill would come down. Mm. 
But the reparations bill was in foreign exchange. Um, so the value of the mark or, or in gold or gold tied marks. So the value of the mark falling inflation was actually not good for reparations repayments because, yeah. um, you know, how many marks you could pay 6.6 6 billion in was just going up and up all the time. And it meant that by 1922, the German government um, was telling the Allies, look, we are in a position where we just can't pay um, these installments at the moment. Um, they got a payment holiday during 1922. Um, and they even asked, um, basically, they they asked, it was, you know, this bubble was was in danger of bursting mm. um, because they asked in November 1922, they asked the French government to suspend repayments for the time being. And could we have a loan of 500 billion gold marks in order to basically stabilize the currency, try and deal with the debt crisis, stop the inflation? Uh, how do the French respond to this <laughs> request? Uh, not very happy about yeah. it. Not very happy to say the least. I mean, they've only just presented the bill in 1921. Yeah. And in 1922, the Germans are saying, oh, we can't pay anymore. And by the way, can you loan us loads of money? <laughs> um, it's, it's a pretty ludicrous request. And the French were very suspicious. And they also had a you know domestic agenda to fulfill. You know, uh, Georges Clemenceau, known as the Tiger, had been in the Versailles um, negotiations the real hard line. He was the French prime minister. Mm. And even, you know, Versailles, which is Lord in history is a harsh treaty. Um, he um, lost his post as prime minister because French public opinion thought they'd let the Germans off. They'd let them off too lightly. Um, so the French were very suspicious that this was the Germans just trying to get off the hook. Given that uh, Germany's, you know, they didn't have enough gold, for instance, to pay back um, these payments to the Allies, it had already been, you know, provisions put in place that they were going to pay some of the Versailles bill in kind, um, you know, with, um, you know, manufactured goods or, or raw materials. Coal, for instance, was one that, that was supposed to be given over to the Allies. Mm. Now, given that um, the Germans were finding this so difficult, that the German mark, because of this printing of money, because of inflation, was really losing its value, and because the Germans were already behind on the payments and saying they weren't going to pay for a while, the French government took a very drastic decision. And in January 1923, they sent 60,000 troops to occupy the Ruhr, which is uh, the largest industrial region mm. in Germany. It's in, it's in Western Germany. And the idea was that they were going to force, you know, force these payments out of the Germans in kind by going into the main industrial region and taking coal, taking steel, uh, you know, taking the, you know, these payments in kind in the form of manufactured goods, raw materials. Wow. Which, you know, is um, gunboat diplomacy, isn't it? It's, yeah. Um, it's certainly not exactly calming the situation down, is it? Yeah, um, I would imagine not. Um, I'd, I'd say it probably exacerbates it. Absolutely. And, of course, you can imagine the reaction of, of the Germans. Um, it was utter um, outrage once mm. again. You know, this is, seems to be a hammer blow after hammer blow, doesn't it? Of defeat in the war, the Versailles, and now this. Um, and and I'd say the, the the one positive, if you like, was it did it once again unified um, the German political scene because everyone was outraged at this. Everyone thought it was a gross kind of um, crime, if you like, for the French to invade like this and occupy German territory. Again, there was no hope of real armed resistance. But what you did see in 1923 was an explosion once again of the paramilitary far-right groups being formed. And they were kind of desperately hoping and waiting to be called 
to fight back against the French. Mm. And the government, um, there was a, now a chancellor called uh, Wilhelm Kuno, you know, they did hold out the possibility that maybe at some point we might want to um, take, you know, take back the Ruhr. So once again, the paramilitary groups kind of got a degree of state support and they were allowed to be trained, for example, by army units and things like this. Right. So there was this hope and and particularly on the right, this kind of fervor for like a people's war, let's mobilize the nation to drive out the French. Whilst that was a slightly unrealistic policy, the government did settle on a policy known as as passive resistance. Mm. So the idea was that just as a general strike had brought the country to a standstill in the Cat Putsch, the Ruhr region was to go into a general strike. Um, They were going to refuse to work for the French. So all these mines and steel mills that the French had hoped would, you know, provide them with payment were going to sit, you know, sit empty. Mm. And the government, um, you know, couldn't just expect hundreds of thousands of workers to go without pay for months on end. Given this was a government strategy, um, the government stepped in to kind of pay the workers' wages. It, it reminds me to some extent, actually, of a policy you've seen in a lot of countries around the world this year, you know, with coronavirus, mm. of, um, you know, paying workers part of their salary when their businesses are shut. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to stay home, but we, we, the government will meet some of your your pay. So very similar to that, really. Um the problem is, of course, that's very expensive. Yeah, and I was going to say the 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 German government really isn't in any position to be making uh, large payments. Exactly, they're already in a tough financial position, and now they've taken on a massive burden. And yet, of course, they'd almost back themselves into a corner here, because if you end passive resistance, then you kind of are seen to be giving in to the French yeah. again. And, you know, tempers were, were rising rather than falling because the French got increasingly frustrated by this strike. Um, and you began to get a quite considerable um, back and forth violence between Germans in the Ruhr and the French occupying troops. You had a total over the eight months of, in, in, in 1923 the main part of this occupation, no less than 132 Germans were shot by the French. Hmm. There was even the case of a a seven-year-old boy who was shot and killed by French soldiers, I think because he was throwing stones. Hmm. Um, You had 150,000 Germans expelled from the Ruhr by the French, you know, obviously for taking part in protests or political activities, this sort of thing. Yeah. And of course, then you had right wing, you know, particularly patriots, nationalists carrying out murders of French soldiers, uh, which, you know, then would be reprisals and things like this. Um, So tempers and and particularly nationalist and right wing opinion was only, you know, flaring up further. Um, And so the government is in this corner because they're having to pay all these workers, but they can't stop passive resistance because it would be seen as capitulating to the French who are increasingly making that harder and harder by their actions. And this just sounds like a powder keg waiting to go off. It, well, precisely, and that is exactly exactly what it was. Um, so the government is already in dire financial straits. The value of the mark is already falling. You know, we've had quite considerable inflation in the start of the decade. They've now taken on the drain of paying these workers their wages, but you've also got to consider the the effect on the ta- on on the state finances of you know the most prosperous, largest industrial region of the country being at a standstill. Yeah, and again, I would compare it to coronavirus of what happens when the economy stops for a few months. Um, so all those businesses, like I say, that was the industrial heartland of the country are closed down. And of course, the tax revenue dries up. Mm. And the unemployment rate soars. And the other thing is that 
of course, if your industrial center is no longer functioning, then your supply of, you know, manufactured goods is going to be less. And of course, very basic supply demand economics. Mm. Well, there's now going to be a shortage of certain products. So prices are going to rise. And then what about vital raw materials? As I said, the coal mines of the Ruhr were, you know, main source of uh, one of the main sources of Germany's coal. And back then coal was an essential for, you know, power, um, for tra- rail transportation. It was an absolutely crucial resource. So Germany had to then import coal, which is an additional cost. Yeah. And it's further spending of foreign currency that they just don't have. <laughs> it just, so it just keeps, get, it just keeps build, building up on top of each other. It's It's crazy so they have as they see it kudos government no choice but to print money Mm. in order to pay these workers um this is where yeah that's where i mean you you have to laugh in a way um because it is so ridiculous um I mean, you know, I mean, we could start with a few statistics, I suppose. Mm. It's always quoted in hyperinflation. Um, the price of bread, uh, a kilo of bread, was already 163 marks in January 1923 because of years of inflation. Mm. By the time you got to October, it was 9 million marks yeah. for a loaf of bread. By the time you got to November, it was 233 billion Um Another thing you can look at is the exchange rate to the dollar. Mm. So um, before World War I, going back a bit, it was um, in 1914, 4.2 marks to the dollar. As I said, in the immediate post-war period, there was very considerable inflation and it rose by 1920 to 64 uh, marks to the dollar. Mm. By January 2023, when the first occupation happened, it was uh, nearly 18,000 marks to the dollar. By the summer, um, it was going up to 353,000 marks to the dollar. Um, By the autumn, uh, September, 98 million. By November, uh, 4 trillion marks to the dollar. 4 trillion. Wow. To one, one dollar. One dollar. I mean, it, yeah. it, it is always, it, it's always funny, you know, when you look at, you know, hyperinflation just because of the mm. sheer amount. But, I mean, imagine the logistics of this. Absolutely. I mean, uh, people's pay, obviously, they kept coming out with new notes that were 100,000, 200,000, a million, a billion, yeah. you know. Um but people's pay could hardly keep up. And, and you ended up, uh, the images are very famous of people being sent home with wheelbarrows full of money as their weekly wage. Yeah, and you um, you hear the old story about how the wheelbarrow is <laughs> worth more than what's in it. Yeah, and and people just playing with money, people shoveling money into the fire because it's cheaper yeah. than coal um, to keep their house warm. And of course, this leads to, in some cases, nigh on, you know, societal collapse. Mm. People resorting to bartering and people, you know, absolutely losing their minds. Um, I, I've got a few quotes, obviously. I think, you know, it's, it's best to um, get the sense of this chaos from people who were there. Mm. Um This is one guy guy called Conrad Hyden describes the situation during the crisis. The printing presses of the government could no longer keep pace. You could see mail carriers on the streets with sacks on their backs or pushing prams before them loaded with paper money that would be devalued the next day. Life was madness, desperation, nightmare, chaos. Communities printed their own money based on goods. A certain amount of potatoes, of rye, for instance, Shoe factories paid their workers in bonds. They could exchange a bakery for bread or meat at a meat market. 
you had gangs of people basically obviously you had a big hike in crime theft mm. primarily um you had gangs of people going out into the countryside looking just for food um one of the reasons for that again just basic supply demand economics was that farmers began to hoard their produce you know not take yeah. it to market this week i'll wait till next week or next month when it'll be worth you know millions or trillions more mm -hmm. um you know the stories of people paying you know going in to a restaurant and looking at the menu and by the time the bill comes at the end of their meal you know the prices of the stuff they've ordered has has risen yeah so much that they can't pay um this is another guy this is um a very famous um artist in the Weimar Republic called George um Grosch and he said lingering at shop windows was a luxury because shopping had to be done immediately even an additional minute could mean an increase in price one had to buy quickly a rabbit for example might cost 2 million marks more by the time it took you to walk into the store a few million marks meant nothing it was just that it meant more lugging and more carrying this around the packages of money needed to buy the smallest item had long since become too heavy for trouser pockets they weighed many pounds people had to start carting their money around in wagons and knapsacks you know imagine carrying a load of money on your back yeah. or something just to go to the shops yeah i mean so obviously you know this is a state of you know collapse in the economy collapse in society collapse in people's confidence in the system as yeah. a whole political and economic um and and you know people who were obviously already in a, a difficult position found themselves in a terrible state um if you were a pensioner or a war widow you know you'd often have a fixed income well that might become worthless yeah. um you know if your income was set at 2000 marks a month or whatever it might be that might no longer well we heard there was no yeah, longer value even a slice of bread yeah um people who had i mentioned before war bonds you know during the war people had lent money to the government it was seen as a patriotic thing to do to buy war bonds well now those war bonds were next to useless you know yeah. because you might have lent them again a thousand marks well that is nothing now um i mean this you is also go on this is unworkable <laughs> yes yes um people you know particularly at the bottom of society could be in a really desperate situation i mean unemployment obviously spiraled out of control um but workers wages often couldn't keep up with the rise in prices um you just imagine um as well it was as that quote said about when you spend your money people rushed as soon as they were paid for that week to spend it all mm. everything they needed for the week because you know if you're paid on the friday night um by next wednesday your pay packet could be really very seriously devalued to the point where it might not um you know buy you anything mm. and this real hardship you know real genuine hardship rate means that you get occurrences spikes big spikes in uh, stuff you see from just poverty i suppose so malnutrition tuberculosis rickets um you also had a big rise in the suicide rates mm. um you can just imagine how this was um in particular i would say really hard hit was the the what was called in german the mittelstand which is kind of the lower middle class these are small business owners artisans and mm. they um uh, were kind of disproportionately hit because they really their costs are rising out of out of control you know a small business you know is often quite precarious because of the costs and that they can hardly get those costs back in in their prices they can hardly keep pace you know unless you're going into your shop window changing the price cards three times a day yeah um they really kind of struggled 
And the reason that the middle class as well were particularly hit, and I think this is probably the biggest one and the one that lived longest with a lot of people, is savings. Yeah. If you've saved all your life, you will see the value of that wiped out in, in days. Um, mm. you know, if you've been putting away a few hundred marks a month your whole career, then <laughs> that saving, those savings just, just evaporate. Yeah. It's you gone know. overnight. You know, and like I say, you just got to try to put yourself in that situation. The, the, how dislocating and how disheartening and utterly crushing it must be, you know, to see that, you know, almost your life's work disappear. Mm. And of course, again, this is people's first experience of democracy. This is the German people's first experience of democracy. Yeah. And this has happened. I mean, it's very hard, I think, for us to put ourselves in that situation of just how just how debilitating this would be. Hmm. I mean, like you said, first impressions matter, and uh, this this is not a good one. And no. I mean, as it's been, as we've seen. There's just so many things that just go wrong. Mm-hmm. It, it's almost like it was doomed to fail from the start. And yet, it's going to continue. What year are we in now? 1923? Mm-hmm. I think the other thing as well, I mean, this undermines confidence in the system. This undermines confidence in politicians. Mm. You know, um and in particular, it, it, it's not just, you know, to some extent, a, a terrible national crisis can pull a country together. If there's a sense of we're all in this together, you know, we need to pull together to to, to get out of this. Mm-hmm. But the other thing about hyperinflation was that there were some people who very clearly won, so to speak, from hyperinflation. Yeah. So clever, you know, clever businesses and speculators just as I've said, they benefited from inflation before because you could take out a loan and repay it a year later. Well, now you can you could take out a loan, you know, in August for several million marks, and you could repay it in, you know, say November when that figure is worth next to nothing. Yeah. Um. And you got people who got extremely rich out of this, who were able to play the market. Um, The the most famous example was a a businessman called um, Hugo Steines, um, who he was already a very successful businessman. But in 1923, he basically thought, oh, okay, this is an opportunity to make a hell of a lot of money. He took out a series of gigantic loans and what he did with them is he bought vast swathes of German forest land um, that would produce, you know, lumber, timber um, for industries, for for mines, things like this. Um, he also used the opportunity to buy uh, 150 businesses, mm. um, everything from railways to banks to magazines. Um, so, you know, he could just take out the money he could borrow the money he needed to buy it using his existing business empire as you know as collateral and then pay back that loan a month six weeks two months later when it was worth nothing hmm. so Incredibly uh, yeah. exploitative. some people did extremely well and it, i think one of the other societally um corrosive effects was it it wasn't just um a few very rich and kind of deviously clever businessmen Mm. because also people might have seen you know people in their own neighborhoods who did all right out of it if you had instead of you know if you were a lender rather than a saver if you were in debt you know if you had a mortgage or something you could pay it off instantly whereas your neighbor might be weeping that their savings have disappeared you might be celebrating because your huge mortgage has disappeared yeah 
um, equally, the, you know, like I said, the farmers did pretty well out of this because, um, you know, food prices just skyrocket and they can basically make a lot of money out of that. And they can hoard their food. They can sell it on the black market. There was a big black market emerged. Um, and so again, people who were clever about it, I suppose, or, or saw this crisis as an opportunity for themselves could do very well. Um, if you were on, uh, you know, if you rented a property and you're on a fixed term contract, mm. you, you know, the cost of your rent might just disappear. Um, Equally, if you were lucky enough to have foreign exchange or access to foreign exchange, foreign currency, then you are like a trillionaire. Yeah. Um, I, I always use the example that, you know, in, in my house, I've got just from going on holiday, you know, I've got a, maybe, you know, 30, 40 euros in my house. That, mm. you know, I don't change it back because I know, I'll, well, until 2020, but I know I'll be going on holiday to Europe sometime in the future. So, I'll keep hold of that. Yeah. Now, if I was living in a hyperinflation scenario, um, then that's 30, 40 euros, you know, or if someone living in Germany in 1923 had 30, 40 dollars, well, in November 1923, that could buy you tens of trillions of marks. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> there was winners and losers, and I think that that in a way was made it even worse. Well, yeah, because I mean, people looked at their neighbours and they looked at big businessmen, and they looked at bankers, and they kind of felt more outraged that they had had to suffer. Yeah, I mean, it it, it sows division on a, a like you say, a neighbourhood scale, you know, a a street based scale where if someone is, you know, <laughs> looking at their neighbour, it's it, the it's crazy and like i said it's absolutely unworkable no doubt and of course um it had to come to an end it had to be stopped and a unity government was formed led by a new chancellor gustav streisman wilhelm kuno's brief stay in the right chancellery was really just disastrous um and he really realized, um, despite him actually being, he was with the DVP, he was right wing, he was sympathetic to nationalist um, kind of causes, but he, he realized, you know, this can't go on. And mm. it, it, his, his solution was, we've got to end passive resistance. We've got to end the strike, so we have to stop paying these workers, and we've got to get the Ruhr region working again, despite the fact the French are there. Of course, um, you know, this was seen as totally outrageous by the nationalist right. Yeah. Yet another betrayal, you know, giving up to the French, not only not fighting back, but, but, but stopping even trying to resist them without, any, by, the, by the way, without any concessions or anything. The French didn't agree to leave or anything. Um, so that really spiked up um, political instability again and violence. You had uh, several minor communist uprisings in 1923 trying to take advantage of the chaos that were quickly suppressed. And you also had a um, growing crisis in, let's go back there, Bavaria, where when it became clear passive resistance was going to end, obviously the, all the extremists that are down there in, in Munich were outraged. Um, Bavaria basically um, put itself into a state of semi-independence mm. um, where power passed back to von Kahr as well as the local army commander, General von Losau. And they basically defied the government in Berlin. There was maybe, you know, suspicions that they were going to either carry out a coup against Berlin or, or declare Bavarian independence. Um, Berlin said they needed to ban the Nazi party and its magazine, its newspaper, because they were obviously decrying the Republic for doing this. Um, and the, the Bavarian authorities refused. Um, as a result, the Berlin defense ministry, you know, the central government tried to sack von Losau, the local army commander in Bavaria, and he refused. And the army units there actually swore an oath of allegiance to Bavaria rather than to the, 
republic and its constitution. Hmm. And it's in this state of kind of political upheaval that um, Adolf Hitler and General Ludendorff and a number of other far-right figures, including actually Perna, who we've mentioned several times this episode, um, decide to basically take a stand and carry out a putsch attempt, a coup attempt from Munich, from their base in Munich, that it's going to seize power nationally. Um, they hope, with the cooperation of von Kahr and Losau, in the end they don't receive that cooperation, and it is also a brief uprising that's quickly put down. We tell that story in um, our episode on, on, on Eric Ludendorff. Um, so I don't think it's, it's, it's worth retelling here, but I think uh, it's worth putting into the context of the hyperinflation is that it also leads to, you know, re- rising political tensions and even armed attempts to overthrow the government. Mm. Yeah. I mean, when we were talking about hyperinflation, I, I, it's easy to forget that your industrial region is occupied by a foreign country. Yeah. Um, it, it, Once again, I think the Weimar politicians were just tied by the hand they'd been given and faced with very few choices, all of which were bad. Um, they kind of ended up having to choose bad, bad options, but options that, that there was very little escaping from. Yeah. Um, in November 1923, actually just after the failure of, of Hitler's beer hall putsch, the German currency was reformed. They created what was called the Rentenmark, the rescue mark, which is just basically start a new currency to replace this valueless, worthless one. Mm. And the old marks were basically gathered in to be destroyed, I believe. Um, and that, along with some helpful loans from the Allied powers, did more or less restabilize the situation. And the following year, negotiations were carried out that secured French withdrawal from the Ruhr and a kind of restructuring of of that reparations debt um, mm. and the payment schedule. So the economic situation did stabilize, actually, to be fair, remarkably quickly. Right. In 1924, after the hyperinflation crisis. But I don't think that's necessarily that important because I think the effect on confidence, the effect on people's faith in democracy, the effect on society was more important in a way than any of the economic effects. Yeah, I mean, the damage had been done. You know, I think you're absolutely right. People's faith in this new form of government for the German people was uh, shaken. And we will see in the coming episodes how the consequences of that, I suppose, that whirlwind, um, it, the, the, sows, the seeds that have been sown are the whirlwind is very much reaped in the years to come. Yeah. I mean, we are still, all things considered, in 1924 now, we are only five years into the creation of this new government. Um, and I, you can't count how many things have gone wrong. Yeah, I think um, what is coming is a, is a relatively brief period of greater stability. However, that is just going to um, be catapulted into a fresh and even deeper crisis to come. Our next episode, though, um, we are going to be looking back at the German Revolution with the help of an expert guest. So we look forward very much to that, our first interview in our Weimar series, uh, hopefully of several. Yes, indeed. Uh, that will be out after this episode. So look forward to that. Absolutely. Well... All that remains, I think, to say is thank you so much for listening. Indeed. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter. And I'm Alex. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.